speak to me about this, the role of the church a little bit in Alabama. I'm, I'm not sure we got into this last time, but I, I want to make sure and bring it up because I'm a, kind of a fan of Hugo Black, and, and I like his Supreme Court decisions. And You know, I got a chance to sit down with Judge Moore Moore right after the, they ordered the removal of the Ten Commandments from the courthouse. And I was working at that time for the New York Times, stringing for them and right for the Christian Science Department. And I had the AOL story of the day uh, when they removed the rock, you know. But after that, Judge Moore Moore had a Roundtable discussion with all the print journals. He wouldn't. He wouldn't talk to anybody during the trial too much, you know. And uh, I got to sit across the table from him, and I basically the one question I had for him got me kicked out of the room by the PR people. But it was like it was basically, uh, you know, how do two Sunday school teachers from Alabama, Hugo Black and yourself, come to such radically different conclusions about the meaning of the First Amendment? You know. I know that it's important, you, despite the campaign in churches, even if you're a Democrat in the state, what is going on with this mixture of religion and politics with the state where Hugo Black said there's a high and impregnable wall that should not be, you know, breached, and we breach it all the time. Well, in, in uh, traditional Baptist belief and the free church tradition beyond Baptist, there's, there is, the argument's fairly simple. Everywhere there had been a state church, it had persecuted free church people people who didn't think they ought to be taxed to pay for somebody else's churches. People didn't think the state should make them do something that was a violation of their religious values. So as a result of that in the United States where you had religious pluralism, no single denomination constituted the majority ever in the United States. And as a result of that, you had to make some dispensation that would help all these various religious groups live together in some sort of harmony. And the simple way to do it was separation of church and state to use Jefferson's term, uh, which he incidentally used in a letter to a group of Baptists who supported him. In well, so those days the Baptists were sort of the stepchild. Oh, the, the, well, the Baptists were the radicals. Yeah. The Baptists were the, were the political radicals because they felt that they were the oppressed. Uh, they were the people whose rights were being violated, and so they fiercely fought against a state church. Hugo Black was just a classic uh, representation of that viewpoint. He come from Clay County. He, first day in Birmingham, he visited First Baptist Church and joined that. He became a Sunday school teacher for multiple decades, uh, and he fiercely believed in separation of church and state. And when he ruled in, I believe it was 1963, in the New York uh, 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 City case where the state of New York uh, regents had written a prayer that everybody was supposed to use in a public school, and Hugo Black uh, wrote the, the a majority decision saying this was a violation of separation of church and state. And George Wallace, uh, who was governor of the state of Alabama at the time, went wild and started attacking Hugo Black and started using this to mobilize working class people in Alabama behind him. And I, I've actually seen the letters of the uh, executive secretary treasurer of the Alabama Baptist State Convention who started writing Baptist leaders and saying, now wait a minute, uh, all Hugo Black has said is what Baptists have been teaching for more than 150 years, 200 years in this country, and that is that there should be a wall of separation between church and state. Uh, unfortunately, after the culture wars of the 1960s, uh, there is a division not along class lines, which is what had been the case before in Baptist uh, theology. So, for instance, uh, you have a First Baptist Church, which is generally upper class, upper middle class, and then you have a textile church, or you have a mine village church, or you have a church on the edge of town that's rural. And most of the members there never went to college. Many didn't go to high school. The pastor is bivocational, which means he's a truck driver, or he's a coal miner, or he's a textile worker, and he knows the lives of the people he works with. Uh, by the 1960s, those churches are being polarized, not around theology and historic Baptist tradition, they're being polarized around culture war traditions. And so people like Roy Moore argue that the real issue here is abortion, the real issue here is publishing uh, the Ten Commandments and posting them on the walls of all the courts and public buildings and schools and suddenly everything's going to be good in America, all our problems are going to be solved, they're not going to be, the good old no more illegitimacy, no more divorce, no more this and that, uh, everything's going to be fine. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, posting the Ten Commandments is not going to make that happen. Uh, prayer in the public schools is not going to make that happen. Uh, and furthermore, you can't prevent prayer in public schools anyway. All you can do is prevent public prescribed prayers. You can't do that. Obviously, uh, anytime uh, 
I took a calculus test. I was praying hard because I was terrible in mathematics. And, and so you're not going to stop people from praying, but you can stop them from praying a particular kind of prayer, uh, ending perhaps, uh, uh, Mother Mary help me, which is fine for Catholics, but doesn't do Baptists a whole lot of good. Yeah, I mean, you could pray anywhere you want to pray, right? I mean, you have the freedom to do that. But somehow politicians are able to exploit that issue and get people to get some of these working people that you know that are serious about their church. They'll follow along on that. You know? Well, you know, and, and I don't think these people. I don't think I'm, I came from a very large Baptist church up in Birmingham. So I, I don't think these people, you know, the working class people, not college educated people, understand the history of the Baptist. No, they, they don't, don't understand. And, you know. and the reason they don't understand it is because we did away with train union, and that was where you learned it. And we did away with preachers who understood it themselves and preached it to their congregations. And so preachers no longer they're concerned about culture war issues, and they're not concerned about Baptist tradition to start with. But I can put the issue fairly simply: if you're a truck driver, or you're a plumber, or you're an electrician, or you're a steel worker, and you live in Alabama, you say, "Well, I, I think I, I, I think my religion ought to become." the way everybody thinks in the state. Let that same guy move to Salt Lake City, Utah, or Provo, Utah, and he won't think so highly of the idea that the majority of people should impose their religious values on the minority. Right. Or if that same person moves to, to New Jersey or Connecticut, uh, how's that person going to feel when, in fact, until the Supreme Court struck down the law, the state of Connecticut prohibited selling condoms and birth control devices because it was contrary to Catholic teaching. Uh, so uh, the truth of the matter is you need to be really careful when you move beyond the idea that these are the religious values that I promote and that I advocate and I teach in my family and I teach to others and which I witness to other people to try to tell and you move to the idea where you're going to impose these by law. Uh, well, that's fine unless you're in Dearborn, Michigan, where the majority of the population is Muslim. I don't think you'd probably want to do that if you were in Dearborn, Michigan.